It's actually the whole generation. Something is wrong with the generation born after 1995. And it's very sharp. If you're born in now, 1995. That's a big thing to say. Yeah. Something is wrong mm -hmm. with the generation born in the late 90s, early mm -hmm. 2000s. Yes. So to be clear, I'm a social scientist. I'm not saying everyone in that. I'm just saying when you look at averages. Tendencies. Uh, when you look at the averages, average tendencies on mental health measures, all sorts of other sociological measures, what you see is that in the in the in the 2000s, the 1990s and 2000s, mental health was not really getting worse. On most measures, it was sort of similar. Suicide rates were coming down. Um, things were getting a little bad. Bad stuff was sort of getting a little less common all the way to about 2010, 2011. Then all of a sudden, around 2012, 2013 almost everything goes up, especially related to depression, anxiety, self-harm, and suicide. Mm -hmm. Those four. Suicide begins a couple of years earlier to go up, but it really, they, they all Would really- Would you throw loneliness in there as well? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Loneliness, although loneliness has been increased, some of them were going down and then up. Loneliness, the other pattern is a lot of things like loneliness, they were going up slowly and then they go up fast. Oh. So you always see an elbow right around 2013. Mm. And my argument in the book, is that the period from 2010 to 2015. That's when the office was canceled. Well, there we figured you go. it out. There you go. Thank you, everybody. That, Thanks for tuning everything in. Everything went to hell and, as soon as you guys went okay. off the air because people had more sense of humor. <laughs> but my argument is that that period was the great rewiring of childhood. So in 2010, almost all teens had a flip phone or you know another portable phone, but all you could do on it was text and phone calls. Um, and so people used it to connect. Technology is great when it just connects people, but by 2015, it was entirely different. Uh, by then, about 70 or 80% of teens have a smartphone with uh, a front-facing camera, they didn't have that before, um, high-speed internet, unlimited data plan, Instagram, Snapchat, all these other platforms, and all of these companies have been granted the right to interrupt you whenever they want. My students don't, young people don't seem to know to turn off notifications on everything or almost everything. By default, you download an app, you give another company permission to interrupt you. So my claim is that the technological environment in 2010 was not bad for teen mental health and a human being could still grow up and go through puberty. In fact, the millennials did. The millennials, I think the dividing line is that the millennials were largely done with puberty by the time by the time everything moves to smartphones. Mm. It's the kids who were early in puberty when everything was onto smartphones and Instagram and Snapchat. That is Gen Z. That makes you anxious. That deprives you of social development. That makes it harder for you to have face-to-face -face conversations. It makes it harder for you to focus. So the technological environment, I believe, derailed human development on almost every track, whether you're looking at social development, focus, attention, cognitive development, self-control, um, uh, esteem, identity, politics, almost everything. At least that's my big claim in the book. What yeah. do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, you know, I have a teenage son. There's some positive aspects to this generation. Okay, let's talk about them. I believe that him and his friends are far more emotionally sensitive. Mm -hmm. They're more... Uh, compassionate generally to the suffering of others and the differences of others. They're much more open to conversations about mental health. Mm -hmm. my, my son and his friends are greatly attuned to what anxiety is, what depression mm -hmm. is, what, mm -hmm. um, what loneliness is. Um, they, they have this in their, in their lingo. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's good, I think about Gen Z is that they, don't accept things the way they are. Mm -hmm. In a different way, other generations yeah, yeah. have always yeah, yeah, rebelled yeah. Right. against certain aspects Wanted of the way things, things are. Yeah. yeah, but this generation is kind of like, why do we have money? I mean, they'll, they, mm -hmm. they're literally like, why do we have a government? Why mm -hmm. do we have, you know, you name it. Why do we have careers? Why mm -hmm. does this work the way that it mm -hmm. does? Why? Why should I be agree that, you know, the democracy, the way it is, is the way it is? Like mm -hmm. they, they question everything at a very foundational right. level, yeah. which I think is a healthy kind of skepticism mm -hmm. because it's not just like, fuck you, man, yeah, fuck power right. to the man. It's kind yeah. of like, you know, I'm being given mm -hmm. all of these things as a reality. Like mm -hmm. this is how 
yeah. economics work. This is how healthcare mm-hmm. works. This is how education works. This is how uh, the environment works. And, and this is how international relations work. And they're kind of like, well, why, why right. should I accept right. this? It's not working. I'm looking yeah. around. It's really not working. Yeah. Why should I accept yeah. any of it? Right. So those are some positive aspects. Okay. You want to address those? Yeah, I do. I'll, cause yeah, I'll, I'll agree with a little bit and then, and then raise some problems with the other parts. So uh, you and I were very shaped by the 1970s and 80s. And these, this was sort of a period where there were still male and female gender roles and they were being questioned. And if, you, if, if somebody had said you know, to us or to society in 1975, you know, in 2024, kids are gonna be open to talk about mental health. You know, it was a stigma back then. And they'll be much more receptive to LGBTQ. We would have said, what's LGBTQ? We've never even heard of it. Um, so if you look at where we were in the 70s and then you describe what you said, that would look like progress. And in some ways it is. And certainly, I mean, the freedom, you know, that LGBTQ kids have, my sister is gay, one of my best friends is gay, and they, you know, they were shamed and my, you know, male homosexuals were attacked. I mean, horrible, horrible. Mm-hmm. So all that is good. But in some ways, I think we we go too far, especially let's say on the mental health. Definitely we don't want we don't want kids who are depressed or anxious or bipolar or anything to feel a stigma, to feel ashamed of who they are. We don't want that. And so that's progress. But what happens sometime, once everyone gets online, this hap- that you get a big switch happening in the early 2010s, is mental illness becomes valorized. And that's terrible. That is horrible. When you say valorized, what does that mean? That the more you have it, the more you seem to have it, the more prestige you get. Mm. And the last thing we wanna do is train young people, especially young women. Young women are much more open to uh, persuade, not persuasion, but emotional sharing or emotional contagion from other from other girls. Do you notice this? The kids say like, I have an anxiety disorder and they get like, oh, wow, that's how brave of you to share that. Yeah. And, and they get right. like so I'm not, their flowers for that. Is yes. that what you're saying? So, right. I don't see that myself because I'm not in these groups. I'm not spying on yeah, them. Yeah, but from the data but, that you're compiling. Uh, from the Right, from the data and from what girls have told me. I gave a talk in Australia years ago and a 16 year old girl came up to me afterwards and said, or uh, yeah, and said, thank you so much for what you're saying. All of my friends are depressed and I have to act like I'm depressed. I have, in order to fit in, um, on, uh, especially on, it began on YouTube, but especially on TikTok. Mm-hmm. Um, TikTok is so powerful in valorizing extreme mental illness. Um, so, you know, dissociative identity disorder is this, is, you know, people feel as though they have multiple personalities, they have divisions. It's always been there at very low rates, but on, on DID, you know, DID TikTok, the more extreme you are, the more followers and likes you get, which encourages other kids, especially ah, girls, okay, okay. to be like that and to identify as that. Mm-hmm. And in psychiatry, there are what are called looping effects, where if you believe, well, I am this kind, let's say take anxiety, my anxiety, I have anxiety, I'm an anxious person. If you accept that diagnosis, and then someone says, hey, do you wanna come out to a party? You say, mm, you know, my anxiety says no. And if you don't expose yourself over and over again, right. you become more anxious. So. In all these ways, valorizing that's a, that's mental a little, illness. That's a little bit different because uh, any psychologist would say, like, if you have anxiety, you have to you have to address it and you have to meet it head on. If you have right. anxiety about flying, that doesn't mean you stop flying. No, it means you you it means you're going to work on it. Your exposure right. so is the that's treatment. That's just a bad uh, adjustment yeah. to the fact that one uh, yeah. views okay. themselves of having a, okay. But anxiety. I'm just what I'm trying to say is that this is that. Uh, uh, mental illness and seeing a therapist, all that was gradually destigmatized from the 70s and 80s when there was still a stigma. By 2010, I think the stigma was largely gone. And then social media has done an amazing job of making that an attractive identity for many young girls. And this can explain why the curves, throughout the book, you'll see curves, they're like hockey sticks. The curves for girls are usually things are flat until 2012, and then boom, they go way up very sharply in a year or two. Mm. uh, Whereas the curves for boys are are generally slower. Mm -hmm. The boys, it's not like 2013, everything changed. It's like, you know, they began to deteriorate in 2008, 2009, and then it gets faster in the 2010s uh, because boys are not as affected by social media. Social media really did a number on girls. Mm -hmm. It draws them in, it trains them, it takes over their social lives, it preys on their insecurities. Boys are on social media and they get harmed in a variety of ways, but they didn't instantly all make each other anxious the mm-hmm. way the girls did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm just saying, all the things you're saying are good things. They're good in some ways, but they actually also bring some bad things. What about them. that? What about the increased kind of 
empathy and compassion let's and talk about uh, that. Connect, okay. and emotional yes. connectivity yes, let's talk to about that. the suffering of others. You now, do you mean the suffering of others or do you mean the suffering of LGBTQ, African Americans, uh, and one or two other groups? Do you mean, gen you think there's th generally more compassion generally, to the suffering of human beings? I, th I think so. I think, I think they're yeah. much more attuned. My son and his generation, mm -hmm. uh, let's say late teens, early 20s, seem to be very attuned to the emotional landscape in a way that we were all clueless about mm -hmm. at age 20. Other people's feelings was just like yeah. not even on my radar. Well, my okay. own feelings was, wasn't even yeah. on my personal radar. Okay, now, okay, I agree that that's been a change, but I wanna point out there is, there is an extraordinary increase in tolerance and acceptance of LGBTQ, lifestyles, race. There are certain things that are politically potent and that are progress. Um, but many people therefore assume because Gen Z is so tolerant about issues that used to be you know, uh, exclusionary or, or discriminatory issues decades ago, because they're so tolerant and accepting, they must be generally tolerant and accepting. I don't think that's true. Hmm. Um, when- um, You're talking about canceling. Yeah, that's right. The idea that someone makes a mistake, says something yeah, stupid, right. and they're yeah. just shut out and exactly. shut down. Yeah. The cruelty that young people will show. So now, they I'm don't not, have an empathy or compassion yeah, I don't think toward so. someone making a mistake and getting right. like, ostracized. Right. There's a famous social psychology experiment it's called the, the Good Samaritan Study. It was done at Princeton. Uh, these were seminary students at Princeton Theological Seminary. And they were, they were doing part of a study, and then they were told they had to go, you know, go a couple blocks away to give a talk that was going to be recorded. And half were told, and yeah, yeah, you have to be there at, oh gosh, you have to be there in three minutes. And the other half were told, you have to be there at, you know, yeah, you have about 20 minutes, but you, you, you might have to head over now. And on the way over, there was a guy just lying there on the ground. Um, and something was wrong with him. It wasn't clear what. Uh, he's lying there on the ground. And these are divinity students who's they're going over to give a talk on the Good Samaritan. I mean, this is a kind of a really you know <laughs> ironic and and sounds like uh, something out of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> the dungeon master's like, you're late to this magic user convention, mm -hmm. and then there's, there's someone on the ground. Do you pass them? Anyway, uh, okay. Keep going. Okay. okay. And so, does it matter whether you're gonna you're thinking about the Good Samaritan? No, that doesn't make much difference as to whether you stop. But are you late or do you have time? That makes an enormous difference. So the late people would rush by they the rush guy. by, that's right. So now let's look at the compassion of Gen Z. Um, if once you move your social life onto your phone, you have an infinite number of things you need to do, they're infinite. And it will expand to take up every available moment. Not for all kids, there are some kids that are able to put limits. But 45, in the last uh, uh, Pew data, 45% of American kids say they're online almost constantly. So even if, you know, even if you're talking with your son, he'll still be, he'll be checking. And even if he's looking, he's thinking about it. He's not fully present. Uh, at, right, there you go. I, I, Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so my point is, Gen Z is, in the, is always in the position of the study, uh, of, the, of the subjects in that Princeton study who are told you're late, you have an infinite number of things to do. Some of the things scrolling past, you should feel compassion for. Oh, that's so bad. Oh, you know, but then, 10 seconds later, you're on to another. Yeah. Um, there's what's called compassion fatigue. We often feel much more compassion for a single person than we do for 100 people. Yeah. So. The Soul Boom Podcast. Subscribe now on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you get your stupid podcasts. <laughs>